Okay, so uh, what we could do now is to try to revisit uh, the exercise that we did uh, last week uh, by trying to see how to map the different functions uh, uh, working with the list of scores and exams uh, using the database table instead of uh, using just a list, uh, an array in, in memory, right? So we could uh, uh, recreate uh, in some way the some functionalities of the course. I, I just try to put some example methods here, working with the database. So at that point, uh, okay, maybe I, I have the add method that will insert uh, a new uh, exam database, or a get all method that will, uh, I would say, return a, the list of exams. Actually, uh, I can say that this method will return a list of exams. Uh, or they should say that the method returns a promise that results to a list of exams, like we did right now. And so all the methods that we are creating uh, will return promises. Okay, uh, and will operate uh, on the database itself. So the main program will always call methods, uh, and will if if the main program needs the results of this course, it will have to wait for the completion of the promises themselves. So what we could do is to merge you know, the part of code that we've been writing with the code from uh, last week. And it was called uh, exams.js. Let's call it uh, again exams. Uh, db.js, so that we remember that we are working on the database. We are opening database. So I'm copying the first lines of today's code. And then I have this uh, function that will create uh, the object for managing the course list. So we have this function, exam list. That will be a constructor function where we can store uh, all the information. We can create also the database itself, uh, could be a private uh, variable inside this exam list. We don't need to call the database from anywhere else than this function that is meant to manage the. The, the database itself. And then we can start, and this is, you see, it's a, it's a local variable, it's not a property, it's not this, this dot db that would be visible to anybody. It's a local variable inside this function, and all the methods inside the function may use this variable as a closure. Okay. So can see this variable, no, and nothing else can see that variable. So it's a sort of a Private value to this function. And so we have the first uh, method that can be add. Huh? So we can declare the add method, which will be a function that takes an exam as a parameter and uh, will return, or we execute the insert code and maybe returns uh, some information that has been added or not. That could be, it could, maybe we don't need it to return anything, just execute the insert. But it would be nicer to have at least the, the possibility of catching an error if it happens. So even the add method would return a promise. So we return a new promise. We only have one statement in this callback. So in this method, return a new promise. And the, all the work will be in the callback of the promise itself. It takes two parameters, resolve and reject, and will do 
the query itself. So we assume that the parameter of exam will be a well-formed exam object. And we can create a query by the query. I uh, was the, insert, the syntax insert. So let, let's, let me try it in the. Uh, I need to write something like uh, uh, insert into exam and then name of the fields uh, code name CFU date score values right? and then we insert the values uh, that may be and just trying to 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 find the right syntax in SQL okay so the code may be one to three, and the name is uh, ABC, and CFU are six, uh, and the date uh, is 22, one, one, and the score is uh, 18, just for testing. If I run this query, okay, it doesn't give me any syntax error. And if I check the data, uh, what's that? Okay, refresh it probably. Yeah, nail the new value. Okay. So, what's that? Or I'm not very familiar with this tool, and in fact, I, I lost the query that I just wrote. No, here, this here. Okay, so this is the query. So it's it's always better to first check directly with a tool uh, with a front end like this, or with a, just with a command line, even by sending a query, in order to be sure that when I pass the, the query into the JavaScript code, I don't have any syntax errors at the SQL level. Okay, so for example, I already have a double S here that. Insert into exam values. Of course, the values are not this constant, but will be five parameters: three, four, five. So this is the query that need I need to execute. And let's run it. So this is an insert, and it calls for db.run to be called on the SQLite database. DB dot run that will take just one uh, parameter, which is the string, and another parameter, a second parameter that is the list of, of arguments corresponding to the question marks. And finally, the callback that will only be used in case of errors. The parameters, the array, will contain the values to be inserted into the table. So values, the first one is the exam code, exam.code. Remember that exam is the argument of the add method. And through, a, I'm using this in the two levels nesting for closure, but it's not a problem. And then we have the exam dot uh, uh, name. It's always best uh, if we have the column names equal to the object uh, property names, so that uh, uh, then exam dot CFU, exam dot date, and exam dot uh, score. Just be careful because the Values that you are writing here are applied in order from left to right uh, instead of the question mark. So what it counts is that maybe the fourth question mark uh, here corresponds to the fourth column that I listed at the end of the query. And so I have to set the date. 
it depends on the order in which I list the columns, uh, which may or may not be the same order in which the columns are defined, and may or may, or may not be the, or the order in which the object properties are listed. Okay, so just be careful not to switch columns uh, inadvertently. Okay, so this should uh, insert the line into the database, and so in the callback, uh, we can check whether there was an error. We can uh, reject the promise, say, okay, there was an error. Otherwise, we can fulfill the promise. Uh, it's uh, um, resolve with, you know, true. I don't have any meaningful value to return here. Okay, the end was the braces. The coding style. Okay, so I don't have really a value to return in the resolve, so I just can return a, a dummy value. In, in order to unlock the if, I, if we are changing something, I need to unlock uh, the then operation, so I need to call the resolve, otherwise uh, the code will never know when this insert operation is, is done. So we can have some high-level code, a main program that will create, uh, will create one exam list and do call some methods in the, of this exam list, and these methods will return promises. So, for example, I have uh, in code, I have some const uh, is new exam list. This is just an object, a regular object, it's not, just, it's not a promise, okay? And if I want to add a new exam, I just uh, write it like before exams dot add, and I will pass the parameter and an exam object. If we want, we can steal from the last week's uh, constructor function for the for the exam. This one. If we want, yeah, we are not learn. We we haven't learned yet how to use modules because otherwise it could just import the other function. So for the moment, we are just copy pasting. Uh, and I need to import also HTS. So right now, what I could do here is to create a new exam. Maybe we already have the code here to copy because I'm lazy. Yeah. So this function should right now call the add method and should add the exam to the database. If we only want the operations to be executed, then that's fine. If we want to check whether it's executed correctly or to do something after it has been executed, we can change. So this is a promise. The result of the add method is a promise. So we could change it then. And we could change a catch if I want. Or both of them or at least one of them. And so the then would have the result and we already know that there's nothing useful there. So I could also have some easier to read syntax, for example. Uh, 
cosa sloca se scuola in sé and in the case block I have an error code that we may use to say that something was wrong error insert and then the error object to be printed Mm, I misplaced some column there. Okay, you want Okay. So if we run this code, it should, if everything is okay, print just successfully inserted. Yeah, it does print it. And if I check the database, it should have, yeah, a new line. Or oh, there's something wrong with the, the way the dates are represented. We need to fix that. Okay, so it has been inserted. If I try to run it again, I'm getting an error here. Unique constraint failed, and so on. Because I'm trying to insert a, a, a new exam with the same uh, code of the previous one, and in the database I, I had a, a primary key constraint on the code field. So in the second case, I, I just to show that how the error is handled. Um, yeah, that was the if the error I'm rejecting, and so it should be able to catch. I, sh I should see this text here. Let me try to run it in the terminal mode. Three, three. Yes, printing the okay, yeah, error in insert. The debug console sometimes, uh, oh, okay, it was here, sorry, I, di I didn't read this text. I was worried because I didn't see my text, uh, and so I was afraid that the exception had been you know, uh, interrupting the program instead of being cached correctly. Okay, it's being cached correctly because the text is here, and then all the error object that uh, is, uh, is printed on the, on the console. Okay, so we see both both paths when everything is right and when something is wrong are correctly handled. If we need to insert uh, 20 new exams, we could do that in a loop here. But uh, if I imagine you are putting this instruction in a for loop and I insert in many exam at once, what we are really doing is ru running many inserts in parallel. And each of them will have its own completion. If we want to sequentialize them, we will need to do extra work. And we'll see in a moment how we, how we can do that. There's nothing wrong with doing things in, in parallel from the JavaScript point of view, because JavaScript will sequentialize them, the operations anyway with its internal um, list of, uh, of uh, functions to be called. Uh, it may be a problem if we are running 20, 50 queries onto the same database at the same time, the database would not be so happy. So sometimes we need to slow down and ensure that some operations are completed. And so we need actually to stop, to wait for the completion of one operation before, before doing the next one. And uh, uh, we'll see in a second how we do that. Uh, and uh, the other, uh, for example, um, okay, sorry. so the add function is very easy because it doesn't return anything. And the other function could be get all. It's actually what we just did before. 
instead it was not uh, uh, this function course names uh, doesn't get all of them it only gets a, a list of, uh, of names but is the same style that we can use to create a list of exams so what we would do here to implement a get all function this dot get all would be a function with no parameters and sorry, and that would return promise and this promise as always the same signature we solve detect and then the body of the promise is the actual work and in this case this, the promise would be would be the results of the db.all query db.all query that I need to write here equal equal to select everything from exam there are no parameters so I can skip the second uh, uh, argument of the function and then I have the callback or the bit all, not all is a callback with two arguments the error code and the rows and if I have some error I must reject the promise if and when I will have some error I will reject the promise otherwise I can resolve the promise with an object containing the list of uh, exams so I have a rows which is an array of objects already but I want these objects to be exam objects, not just plain objects. So I can call the constructor of exam for each of the elements, for each row of the database. Remember, these objects are objects, plain objects, which have the different properties, exam.name, exam.cfu, exam.score, corresponding to the column names. But I want, I have a constructor that constructs exam objects, so I need to, I want to return a list of this, an array of this kind of objects, not just plain objects. That basically have the same properties, but they're constructed by me. Hmm? To be consistent with the rest of the code. So, the easy way would, would be to resolve, of course. I could resolve just rows. And I give you the array of objects. Or if I want to change the type of uh, object that they return, I could just map uh, the rows uh, to the object that I want. This is what the question? Yeah. Why? Why? Add is all. DB that all. DB has four methods: run, all, and the other two I never use them. Each uh, or and uh, some. No, I don't remember the first one. Um, okay, so I'm mapping each element of the row into by taking an element, so some object, and I creating for each of them a new. Let's go to a new row, fine, new exam, let's call it E just for avoiding confusion. So the exam constructor takes code, so the E dot code, then it wants a name, E dot name, then it wants a CFU, E dot CFU, E dot score, and E dot date. Okay, there's no semicolon here because I'm just returning this expression. Right. Mm, 
open, closing the map and closing the resolve. Okay, I, I tried to do everything in one line instead of doing the map and then the result of the result of the map. For each object, I'm creating a new XI mode. Okay, let me try it. So let's do some exam dot get all. I want to print all of them, and so I have to do it. Do it in a then callback. Like this, for example. The return value of exam dot all is useless because it's a promise. I cannot use it anymore except by chaining a then operation. Let me see if I did anything wrong. Exam is not defined yeah, because it's uh, list dot exam. Exams, exams. Like that. Okay, it printed something here. Uh, let's see in the terminal where it doesn't stop the debugger. Okay. Running in the terminal, I see all the objects that have been created. Okay, so this is the general pattern. I need to do a query, I run the query and I wrap the result of the query into a promise so that in the code, the main code is going to call this query, I can operate on the results in the then callback. It doesn't basically solve the asynchronicity problem. It's still everything asynchronous, but it's cleaner. <laughs> it's a bit more understandable. And this is fine if I want to chain operations. So maybe here uh, I want to, I get some other operation to do from the list of uh, maybe for each of them, I want to do something. And so I create new promises that would resolve for each element and so on. So it's, uh, um, we, we can continue. Huh? So as long as we want to chain different operations on the result of a single promise, we are okay. But what if we really wanted to wait? So if you really wanted to wait uh, uh, to get the list of all exams after the addition of the other one, uh, I should have simply put this into the then statement of the previous one. So this one has a just console log and just, uh, I guess just try to take all of this and put it here. And then it will be executed only immediately after the insert. Uh, by, by chaining it. Or having this code return a promise and uh, having chained the then, change this operation to the then of this other promise okay? using the chaining code that we saw. But if you really want to wait, uh, there's a simpler way. It was introduced uh, later on in a couple of days after people started to use uh, promises. There are two new keyword, uh, language keywords. And they are called async and await. Uh, that are a simplified syntax uh, for handing promises. So they are not a different mechanism than promises. They are they are using promises, they are generating promises, they are consuming promises 
with the simple syntax. We avoid in some way the use of then and catch. Then is translated to await and catch is translated to a regular exception in the language. Huh? Let's see how it works. Um, first of all, you could you should declare that a function returns a promise with a keyword called async. Okay, you are declaring when you're creating a function, you are creating a function with an async keyword just in front of a function definition. This is telling to the compiler from the syntax point of view that this is a function you can wait on. It will return a promise. It doesn't change the nature of the function. It doesn't change the way promises work. It only tells the compiler, OK, this is a function where we can use the other keyword, which is uh, away. So it's just a, a, a tagging the, the function in a, in a given way. Um, the await function, the await uh, keyword, instead implicitly stops, suspends the execution of this code until the promise returned by an async function is resolved or rejected. Okay. Um, so async doesn't do anything special. Uh, except uh, that internally they are managed in a, in a separate uh, event loop uh, for, for scheduling, but it's nothing that has uh, impact uh, on how we uh, write the function. The real work uh, is uh, this await keyword. Await can be used to wait for a promise. It means that if we have, if we have a function and that returns a promise, so it may have been declared as an async function. We can use the await keyword in front of the function call. And in this case, await stops the execution of this code, waits uh, for the promise to be resolved or rejected, and then continues by putting into this return value the resolve value of the promise. So basically, this return value is what we will have inside the callback of the then in, in a normal promise. Hmm? So if the promise is uh, successful, then await will return the resolved value. If the promise is rejected, then await will throw an exception with that error call. So in a way, await uh, makes uh, synchronous what previously was asynchronous. Because it only proceeds, and uh, uh, actually in the, in the, the next instruction, we are sure that this value is available. It's not a promise anymore. It's the result of the promise already. Or we are we have an exception that we need to, to catch or just to let it happen. But it's a regular synchronous exception, it's not a catch method. Okay, so this is good if we don't need to do anything else in our code while waiting for, for the result of a of a previous of a previous promise. So uh, let's I don't want to. Okay, let's, write, let's do that in our code. Okay. So we have this uh, code that helps us uh, query the database and then, oh, let's comment this code, and then uh, print the result. We can do that. We can do the same thing using the await keyword. Okay. By saying, okay, uh, I want the list of exams, uh, my exams, uh, so const my exams, uh, is just the result of a get all, so exams of, 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 of get all, 
right now, exam.atol is a promise. I want this to be the result of the resolved promise. And I need to wait for this. So in this case, I can then print them. I do the same thing as before, but I'm waiting. By the way, it doesn't really work yet because uh, it gives me a syntax error on this await statement. Why? Because the rule says that the await instruction can only be used inside an async function. Okay, right now we are in the, uh, at the top level of code is not a sync; it's a synchronous code. So to use this await, I must create a, a, a function declared a sync with the code inside. So I can call uh, the function, I don't know, uh, every or, or my code, define a function main. Function main. And I declare this function to be a sync. And I put everything inside. And indent. Let me comment. And then, of course, I need to call this function. Otherwise, it will just sit there. What does it mean to declare this function async? It means that this function will return a promise. Right now, this function is not returning anything. And nobody is waiting on it. So, OK. Actually, it return a promise that results to undefined. Right now, but uh, implicitly, an async function always returns a promise, and these are two consequences. One is that if I write something here, I reach point number two, this log will be asynchronous with respect to the body of the function. So calling main doesn't mean executing all the instruction in main and then returning. It means starting a promise in which the code of main will be executed. So I call it the function in a normal way. Unless I await for the conclusion of the function, I'm calling it asynchronously. And it will return a promise. I could return the promise of the main and use it use the value as a normal promise. I could do main dot then and do something. So as nothing, it's just a simplified syntax that gets rid of the return new promise. In a synchronous function, we only add this one line: return new promise. This line, return new promise, is now replaced by async. They are equivalent. We can, we can mix async with promises the way we want. There is nothing new. It's just a simplified way of writing. Okay, So we can take an async function and process it with the then, or a normal promise and process it with await. You can, you, you can mix it. Hmm? Um, OK. So right now we only made the, uh, the main asynchronous because it's calling some asynchronous function inside. And so it must be asynchronous itself. And if the main returns a value, this value would be the result of a promise. So inside an async function, we have two shortcuts, three. One is the async keyword replaces the new promise that we had before. Second, 
the return instruction replaces the resolve callback. And three, any exception inside this uh, code, so if we, if we throw an exception or we encounter an exception, it will correspond to a reject of the promise. Okay, so code that looks looks uh, um, synchronous is automatically converted to the basic operation of promises. Creating a promise and returning a promise, a sync. Resolving the promise, return. Or rejecting the promise, exception. Okay, inside an async function, we don't have the resolve and reject functions anymore to call. We just have a return or throw. Hmm? So, but right now, the main doesn't have to do anything special, asynchronous, just be aware that it's asynchronous, and so this uh, console.log will happen before the rest of the main. Hmm? So if I put a console.log here, one, I expect to see the two before the one. The two is here, after the main call, because the main will be asynchronous. Okay, but the, we had to do all of this in order to um, use the await keyword. So, of course, I cannot await. Uh, Waiting for the result of a promise automatically makes my code asynchronous. In JavaScript, you cannot block the code, the execution. So, if you want to wait something, then here yeah, you move aside, <laughs> and aside you are waiting in parallel to the main thread. Uh, it's forbidden to block. It's impossible to block the execution. So whenever I say, okay, I need, I don't have anything else to do until this promise is fulfilled, then you can do that, uh, but your function, your calling function, automatically becomes or must become asynchronous, so inside the promise or inside an async, so that the execution of the function itself will be broken into two parts before the await and after the await. And it's uh, like we, if we had a callback, that is, the rest of the function is sort of a callback that will be called after the resolution of the promise. Instead of being inside a callback, it's just uh, after, in the lines after. Okay? So, uh, this should work as before, probably. And it prints uh, this console.log here brings the four thing exams. Uh, we have one more because we added that there. And at this point, we can actually add one exam and after adding it, query the result. Okay, so for example, we can uh, add a wait. add dot new exam and we change the code so that it will succeed wait exams dot add we can change the code and we can see that the, we are in this way. In this way, we are sure that the get all will always be executed after the add. This await is telling me, okay, all the rest here of the code should be in the then callback of this first promise, if we were using thanks. And so it will print for sure 50, 50, uh, 15 exams. I'm sure here. Because the get all is not executed until the add is finished. Because of this await instruction. Okay, so in this way we are writing code that looks synchronous, but it's still asynchronous. Is still based on promises, and promises are still based on callbacks. But we don't need to manage by hand all of these details. 
Okay. With async and await, I could also rewrite in a simpler way, for example, this get all function. Let me write a copy. This dot get all two. I would define it as an async function. That will just need to return the value. In this case, it's not easy to do because uh, uh, how the um, SQLite uh, library is working. Because there is no way of returning a promise unless I'm creating one myself. Okay, so. I would need to create a promise just to return it in this case. So it will not be much simpler. Because the library SQLite 3 is not yet was developed before promises, so it doesn't use promises in its results. But in other cases, I could just write uh, something like uh, uh, return a value. Huh? Something. And this return will be automatically translated into a line. This async will create a promise and return will resolve the promise. We know we can't do that with SQLite because the return would be inside the callback so we not return from the main function. So we cannot translate that into async functions immediately using SQLite. Right? We need to create promises. We, we will do that, or we are able to do that, if we are using objects that already return promises. For example, here, it's, uh, we could, for example, a stupid operation to do, but uh, let's do, let's call get all const uh, list equal to this dot get all. And then we can return, not to get all, get, let's say, let's call it get first. Return list zero, the first time. So if we look, this is a stupid, a stupid way of doing that. I'm doing the query for everything and just return the first time. But look at the structure. Actually, this function get first uh, is, is creating a promise and returning a promise. What is the value that is being resolved in this promise? Is this value list zero, the first element of the list? How can I get this list? I'm calling another promise, get all. Sorry, I forgot what this await. I'm creating a promise, so I'm using a function that returns a promise, and I'm waiting until the end of the operation of this function. When the promise is resolved, I save the value, the resolved value, not the promise itself. So I don't see explicitly the promise anywhere. It's there, I know it's working. I'm getting a promise, waiting on the promise, getting the result and fulfilling the promise that I'm just uh, returning here. Of course, the return of the promise is immediate. Okay, the get first function returns immediately with a promise and the fulfillment of this will be done much later. So it's called a still, uh, don't, don't let yourself be Don't necessarily misunderstand uh, this call. It's not synchronous call. It looks like, but it's still asynchronous. So we, we know that this instruction will be executed sometimes, and after that, after some time, this other one will be executed, and then also the main function will resume. Huh? If we, again, here, we are just uh, on the first exam, Uh, 
await exams dot get first. And so we can print it. For example, the score for the first exam. It will tell me that my first score was a Okay, the insert can run. I can't run the insert because the code is duplicated, so I will comment it. But my first exam was an 18, for example. It will tell me. Okay, so there are two ways of creating a promise. One of creating it explicitly and in the callback, calling reject or resolve, or defining a function with the async keyword and then returning the fulfillment value. From the point of view of the color, they don't make any difference. And the color may use a weight or use a then in a totally equivalent way. Okay, so you can use the syntax that you prefer. Of course, a weight and uh, uh, a sync only works uh, with functions that themselves return promises. And so the, for example, SQLite read um, db.all doesn't return a promise, uh, and so it's not, uh, you cannot put it into a, um, an async function. Not easily. Hmm? But once you have the first thing, this is a function that we created, and our function returns a promise, then it's very easy to Await on this function and go forward with that. Okay, so the code is much more readable. We just remember uh, always that, uh, okay, in this case, one comes before two, but it's, it may be the reverse. They don't. I predicted that the, uh, two would be before one, but actually the reverse, but asynchronous doesn't mean predictable. Okay, so uh, in the in the lab uh, of this week, uh, you will have some uh, exercise to do with by applying these patterns with the um, with the films uh, database that uh, in last week uh, you you had uh, just with arrays, uh, and now we are trying to move that into database uh, and create some methods, and uh, uh, this method will always return uh, promises. And then the main program will, and if you need from one method to call another method, you can do that with promises, or we can do that so with the then, or you can do that with, with a wait. Okay, so the main program probably should use a wait. Uh, if, if you forget a wait, uh, what happens? It happens that my exams uh, is confusing because it will be the promise object. It is not forbidden, you can do that. But then my exam will be a promise object, and here I would print the promise, not the value. I will print it immediately with a promise object uh, with some parameters internal to the promise. Maybe I want to have the promise so that I can resolve it later, and so later on I will do my exams dot then and do something. We just need to be aware whether at a given point we are handling the return value or the promise itself. The promise needs to be resolved before. Yes? Okay, we a try catch statement normally. So yeah, for example, we had an error here that stopped the program. I know that this may generate an error. So we have a try catch 
we put the await statement into so the asynchronous operation in, inside a try block, and then we can handle the error normally because the asynchronous error is translated into a synchronous exception into the, the, the calling code. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to, to mention that. For example, the insert was not possible. And right now, we should, of course, not insert that, but print a kind error of message instead of calling exception. Thanks for the question. Yes. So again, the then and the uh, catch are just translated into return values and uh, um, normal exception that we handle with a try catch block. And also for, like we said here, we can return or throw an exception. Uh, maybe get all doesn't return any value because the, the exam list is empty. So we, to be more robust, our code should check if uh, List dot length is equal to zero, then throw an exception uh, and it. Otherwise, read on the list the first time. Okay, here we have the string. I should the the, the, the linter tell me I should you should create an error object. Okay. No error. Even with with a string we work. Okay. So in this case we are hiding the reject inside the throw and hiding the resolve inside the return. Okay, so most of the code you write will be of, of this of this kind, but of course we need to understand what's working behind the scenes, and also always not forgetting to declare a sync the different functions. Because if if you forget the async, await will not work. You see that immediately we have a syntax error here. If we forget the async, because it's uh, just an indicator that uh, okay this function doesn't work in a normal way. And the async keyword, uh, the await keyword is illegal in a function which is not declared async. We will not compile that if, for, if you forget. But it, we discover it when we're doing await. Uh, if we didn't do this await and maybe this value was computed some in a different way, then we risk of forgetting that this, very, this function is a synchronous function. So it cannot be awaited on. It doesn't generate uh, promises. So it's a very a little syntax in there, so it's it's good on the on the eyes because we don't have a lot of syntax. But it's also since it's so small, it's also uh, easy to forget. So always we should always our, our, ourselves: uh, is this a synchronous function returning a value, or is this a synchronous function returning a promise? And so remember to put the keywords. Okay. Um, okay so I, let me check if I have something, anything interesting to tell you. Uh, probably. No, it's just a, co a comparison between a sync and then, but I think we got it. Uh, yeah, you see the, you remember the, the, the code that we saw before about uh, the, the GitHub with the, with the chaining of the dance? Now we just a sequence of our weights. It doesn't change the understanding. Of course, it simplifies mm -hmm. the syntax. Uh, okay. So these are here we have the, the 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 response to the dilemma that we had at the beginning. How can we add a, a one and then count the numbers in a synchronous way for avoiding all the overlapping, the uh, not the non deterministic overlapping? Uh, with promises it would be difficult with the then because we need to nest again one then inside the other. With the await is just uh, one loop. Uh, where we explicitly wait for the completion of an operation before another. So what has been what has been really complex to do without a wait becomes really easy at this moment. Okay. 
Okay, so um, this is all for this uh, part of asynchronous uh, JavaScript. Ah, okay, this is interesting, but uh, I, I like to wonder about uh, which one is the correct one. Maybe next time you tell me. Uh, no, I just want to say uh, this week uh, we have the lab on to this asynchronous operation and databases. And next week we will be starting to work uh, on the front end on the browser. Okay, so the next week will be mainly on static pages without, uh, we won't in, insert JavaScript on the front end yet on the first week. We are giving to, uh, we are going to give you a list of readings to do. Okay, uh, we don't want to spend our, uh, some time at 8.30 in the morning here telling you about the HTML tags or something which is very simple, very low level. And so we are sharing a document with two or three links uh, that we expect you to, to read, at least read before next uh, Tuesday. So in the classroom, we can do some exercises with uh, uh, HTML and CSS, and we're ready for next week uh, for inserting JavaScript also on the client side, where well, these promises will come very, very handy. Okay, uh, thanks for everything, and see you next Tuesday.